Hi, today we're talking about framing debates. It's very, very important to realize that debating is not simply about having more arguments than your opponents. Before even jumping into your arguments, it's very important to understand what you need to prove in order to win the debate. And this includes making educated guesses about what your opponents will run or how they will approach the debate. So there has to be a strategy behind your case or behind your general approach to the round. And once you understand what your overall strategy is, then it becomes easier to identify and prioritize arguments. So again, as a team, you are not simply selling individual arguments. You're selling a worldview. You're selling a story, right? You're selling a certain version of reality. And the individual arguments you have need to fit this coherent big picture. And frames, these things are called frames. They are useful for your case overall, but also for individual arguments. So you also pay attention to how you frame individual arguments. And it's important when framing your case to be realistic. So when painting a picture of your world, avoid absolute characterizations or too good to be true characterizations because you will appear naive and they can be easily questioned by the other side. Even when framing your case, recognize the trade-offs, recognize what you're giving up, right? So with that introduction, these are the next things we can expect from this chat. First, we're gonna talk about the decision points you have in prep time. Second, we will focus on the decision points that are more directly related to framing. And then we'll talk a bit about uh, stealing the moral high ground in debates and then apply these tips and strategies to, spe to specific examples just to illustrate how they work in practice. So let's go to decision points in prep. When you look at a motion, here are the decision points uh, you need to go through. First, to make sure that you define the key terms in the debate and make sure that you and your teammate are on the same page about how these key terms are defined, right? So let's say the motion is this house would lift patents on green technology. You and your teammate should understand and have a working definition of what patents are, what is green technology, right? Usually that's easy and straightforward. Next, what is the context or issue you are addressing, right? There is probably a reason this motion has been set. And this is one of the decision points we're going to go into detail about in a bit. Third, what are the things you need to prove to win the debate? Whose lives need to be better off for you to win? Fourth, you need to decide on a position or a stance, and this will help filter your arguments. Basically, what are you defending? Fifth, in some cases, you'll need a policy or a model, and this must fit the scope of the problem you've identified. Sixth, what, what do you expect the other side to stand on? And what are you trading off as a result of your stance or what you're defending? And lastly, that's when you start choosing the most logical and most persuasive arguments, start prioritizing them and building them. So let's talk first about identifying the context or the issue to be debated. So a good place to start would be to ask yourself what might be happening in the world or what has happened in the world that is related to this motion. Um, and then move on to the next step of what specific aspect of the problem are you trying to address? So recognize that you are unlikely to solve the entire problem and you are not expected to save the world in your speeches, right? You're simply expected to prove that the world is better off or less worse off as a result of your side. So debate is usually about gradients and not absolute. So a good way of thinking about it is in life, we first... Um, identify the problem, and then find a solution that fits the problem. In debate land, we have to defend a particular solution and then identify the problem that it solves. Uh, so let's say the motion is, um, this house should cooperate with Iran in resolving the conflict in Syria. So you might know a lot about Syria, or your almanac might tell you a lot of things about Syria. Um, but a history lesson about the ethnic conflict in Syria uh, and the uh, different governments that have ruled it is not really helpful in this situation unless it answers the following questions. What power does Iran currently hold in relation to the Syrian regime? 
So it provides military cooperation, it provides intelligence to the Assad regime, what kind of influences it hold over Assad, right? How powerful is Assad and how easy is it really to dislodge him? Um, and Iran's influence over Assad and their material help to his regime make it very hard to remove him or to make him behave with accountability. And um, Syria has essentially become a proxy war between the West and Iran. We, And so your policy addresses these specific parts of the problem. Your analysis must be targeted to these specific parts, right? And in terms of the trade-offs, you recognize that cooperating with Iran might mean it becomes harder to directly target Assad for removal. You may antagonize Saudi, but you do end up with a more cooperative Assad and fewer lives lost. Um, again, I need to emphasize that when characterizing the problem, you make sure that you focus on aspects of your problem that you can actually address with your arguments. Otherwise, the discussion is just irrelevant. Your job is also to show that your arguments apply in the greater likelihood of cases. You don't have to prove that they're true every single time. Now, opposition team goes through a similar thought process, right? Do you agree with how the government teams characterize the problem? Do you have a different understanding of the problem? Do you disagree with the size or the nature of the problem? And the way you diagnose the problem is important because it helps you justify your succeeding steps that you're defending in the debate. So, for example, if proposition team argues that cosmetic surgery reinforces low self-esteem for women, which is why it harms feminism or it should be banned, um, and they characterize the choice as especially coercive, you need to think hard about in prep what your conceptions are of choice in relation to cosmetic surgery or their effects on women's lives. Like, do they lead to better outcomes or worse outcomes? So that's, that's uh, the discussion of context and identifying a problem that your case solves. Next is when you develop your stance or your position and your trade-off. So some framing-related questions are, what do you support? What do you stand for? And it really helps to be able to summarize this succinctly in like three or two sentences and check with each other in prep if you're able to do so. And then tie every aspect of your case back to this thing. It's also very important to be preemptive, right? What do you expect the other side to stand on? And why is your principle stronger? So for example, when you are defending offensive speech, why is free expression and um, a free exchange of ideas superior to the offense that might be felt by some groups? Or how free is free speech really? Because you can also expect to get challenged on this by the other side. Or when you're defending military action against the state, what are all the other possible options that you probably can expect the other side to run? And why are these options no longer viable? Why is it fair to say we've given them a fair shot and that they haven't worked? It's also important to be specific, right? So you're going to encounter motions like um, requiring parents to vaccinate their children. So if all the things and medical decisions we allow parents to do or to take for their kids, what harms are exclusive to vaccination that makes it so hard for us to let them decide for their children? It's also important to identify limits and think through this in prep, right? Um, it helps to have a clear idea of the exceptions to your principle or the limits to your principle and that you can differentiate what you are defending from similar situations. So if you're going to ban professional modeling for children and your rationale for this is it's extremely competitive and it harms their esteem and it exposes them to uh, like complex issues like drugs and um, partying and may interfere with their studies or their development as children, you might want to be able to distinguish this from competitive sports for children. Uh, or if you're banning speech that incites violence, uh, where do you draw your line? If like you're defending hate speech, but banning speech that incites violence, like why are you drawing your lines where you are drawing them? Um, if you're banning um, drugs, what are your thoughts on alcohol and smoking, right? Sometimes you are better off arguing that what you are defending is a logical extension of the status quo. And sometimes you might be better off arguing that it is a radical break from the status quo, but it's something that you need to do. So just be conscious of these uh, tactical choices that you have to make and then frame the debate accordingly. 
And then in opposition, it's also important to think this through and identify the many ways that your stance might change depending on how prop angles their case, right? So if they like your stance might change when you're talking about like developed societies with more well-established welfare systems versus societies with weak welfare systems or societies that have more liberal forms of democracy versus those with more liberal forms of democracy. Um, and again, all the steps I've outlined about developing a stance and um, identifying your limits and being preemptive are things that the opposition team also has to think through. Um, do you accept the government's policy? Do you have any clarifications? Um, do you accept the problem? Or would you rather recharacterize it because you feel proposition may have exaggerated the problem or misattributed it to the wrong source? You could propose a counter solution, although if you do that, recognize that you are conceding that there are problems with status quo. And you also need to make sure that um, all your model-based criticism of the other side doesn't apply to this new counter solution that you're proposing. So if you say their model isn't feasible, there's going to be a backlash, you better be able to make sure that there's a clear distinction that demonstrates that these effects are not significant in this new counter solution you've proposed, right? I mean, you could also argue that even if there is a problem, the, the government's world is far worse than the world we live in. Um, and finally, if the proposition's case is very, very soft, then you can point out problem solution gap. Um, so if a team uses like very urgent, evocative uh, language to demonstrate a real urgent, important problem, they spend a lot of time on this, and then they offer a very soft solution, or like a very small change in the status quo, then you can accuse them of being morally inconsistent, undermining their own case. And on top of this, for very, very little marginal to no benefit, they're still likely to incur the costs, right? They make use of resources, they make use of political capital, there might be a backlash, and that makes it harder to undertake even stronger measures later on. Um, all right. And then another thing that I want to reference here is a discussion of painting a realistic picture of the world that I mentioned in the introduction. Um, it's very important to avoid absolutes when you're building your arguments. So what you want to do instead is focus on social norms or sustainable trends that are favorable for your side. But you still you know, need to prove that these exist. And then you want to identify tipping points like recent developments or agreements reached that prove that your reading of these trends is the correct reading. Um, so, for example, in a motion, this house believes that the U.S. should make Iran its primary partner in the Middle East. An extreme form of argumentation would be to say there are no human rights violations in Iran. It is a fully democratic country and it strongly abides by international laws and norms. If you make this argument, you will easily shut down. It's unnecessary to have to prove this. Also, it's just untrue and you're not expected to have to prove this, right? So reasonably nuanced argumentation would, uh, would include a discussion of strong indicators of moderate reform within Iran based on results of recent elections, or to point to their willingness to work within international law or work within the rules, or their willingness to give up their nuclear program and open themselves up to inspection. Uh, maybe a comparison between Iran and the current like primary partner of the US in the Middle East, Saudi. Uh, and uh, Iran is necessary in uh, beating ISIS. So it's very important to be more nuanced in your argumentation. Or even like when characterizing the effects of certain policies on certain social groups, like minorities are not homogenous. Um, within minority communities, you're going to have elites. You're going to have people who still hold relatively more power over others, even if as a minority, they are experiencing structural oppression. So, I mean, women as a political category is a good example of this, right? Uh, policies have differential effects on women. While we can draw general conclusions about the forms of violence that women experience by virtue of being women, based on their common experience of being women, sometimes the motion might call for more nuanced argumentation about the effects of certain policies on subgroups within the big group. Um, 
So it's important to be able to identify gradients rather than arguing absolutes. Having said that, it's also very, very important to make sure you don't end up contradicting yourself. Um, and when you are presenting uh, nuanced arguments or arguments that, that or arguments about how specific policies have differential effects on different groups, it's important to troubleshoot contradictions or tensions in your case. And, and this can be done usually by segregating the groups and talking about how the policy affects each of them differently, just to do so in a very conscious way, in a deliberate way. So the judges and the teams in the round know that you understand what you're talking about and you're talking about like different cases. So for example, uh, a debate about affirmative action for women in parliament, right? There could be a potential problem if in the first speaker case, the entirety of the discussion is about how we already have a large group of very, very qualified women who have um, political experience, public administration experience, formal academic training in this field, um, who are excluded from running for office because political parties don't think they are back candidates don't take a chance on them or voters don't elect them because of perceptions that women aren't strong leaders. So the premise of this argument is the current system isn't meritocratic because we already have disqualified women, these competent women who exist, but they're excluded from the system. And then your second speaker argues that because women don't think there is a path to success in a political career, many of them just don't bother to engage with it. Many young women don't bother taking up politics or, or studying politics in university. They don't bother entering into careers for which this is, uh, this is um, like for which a political career is the end goal. Um, they move into other industries. They, they just like disengage completely. And this policy generates interest and energy and gets like a lot of women to participate because now it is possible for them to secure seats. These two aren't inherently contradictory. They are speaking to different groups of women. Um, they can, the cases, the arguments can coexist, but unless you presented in a more deliberate and self-aware way, you do open yourself up to the other side saying, which is which? First, you say that there's like a set of like very meritocratic women, very qualified women who already exist. And then in your second argument, you go not quite because women in general have a tendency to disengage from the political system, like which is which, right? Okay. Now let's do a bit more workshoppy things, like how to steal the moral high ground in debates. What do you do? If your topic requires you to oppose granting rights or benefits to vulnerable populations or to defend a position that is unpopular, like using torture or military invasion. Um, so what do you do when your opponents say, look, when we're dealing with women or children or uh, low income individuals or indigenous populations, something is better than nothing. Like we should do our policy because at least it's doing something versus nothing that your side is defending and organic change is too slow, et cetera, et cetera. In these situations, how do you not look like the bad guy in the debate? Um, so first, I think it's important to acknowledge the concerns or in or intentions of the other side, but say that they are misguided and there will be unintended consequences. So even if they intended for the effects to be one way, those are not the effects that will actually ensue. Um, so here are some sample responses to a few of these motions or topics, right? So when you uh, provide people social rights by virtue of legislation or top-down state policy, you can argue that there are consequences in the form of social backlash that can leave the vulnerable population open to bullying or intimidation or violence. So that it's important that there is social acceptance of rights before people can meaningfully exercise them. Otherwise, we are unable to guarantee that they will be accessed and exercised and might even leave us in a position where they are worse off than when we started. So for example, adopted children, couples being bullied, and things like that. You can also talk about other unintended consequences, like in the field of labor economics. Uh, in a debate about mandatory minimum wage, 
you can argue that while the intention of minimum wage legislation is to protect uh, vulnerable workers, what actually can happen is companies end up laying off less experienced workers because they don't think that the value they contribute to the company is equivalent to a minimum wage. Um, and when and, and the first workers to be hit are those with less experience, less education, or uh, less ability to work full hours. So in effect, we hurt the same people we were purporting to help with minimum wage legislation. Um, you can also argue that prioritizing a certain solution can be quite short-termist um, and makes it harder to gain political capital for more sustainable solutions later on. So solutions that involve financial reparations might make it harder. So this financial reparations for oppressed minorities might make it harder to back more sustainable legislation against the discrimination or land reform, which would have had more robust and long-lasting uh, positive effects on the lives of these communities. Another argument uh, against an paternal interventionist policies can be that we alienate the direct stakeholders involved and make them disengage from the state and other service providers. So, for example, the motion requiring doctors to report uh, suspicions of domestic violence um, can lead to patients who are victims of domestic violence no longer seeking medical help uh, for fear that doctors will report or not being allowed to seek medical help by their abusive partners, which could actually lead them to lose their lives. Whereas if there was a lifeline and regular trust established through their doctor, maybe there's a better chance of intervening to save their lives or eventually persuading them to report. But if they suddenly start thinking of the doctors as not being on their side um, and when they are not ready to like um, go against their partners, this might lead to them not seeking medical help. Or that some uh, well-intentioned interventions may backfire. So affirmative action for women in parliament, um, in some countries like Egypt, for example, has led to tokenism or, quote-unquote, the wrong women getting power. So women, elite women already connected to um, men with high positions in government and business who end up voting along conservative lines anyway. But now the situation is worse because they provide a veneer of legitimacy for what's happening because they tick the women box, right? Or how granting new rights when there's no social consensus behind granting this right is dangerous because that makes the existence of the right vulnerable to the whims of the administration in power or to political election cycle. So, for example, the arguments against judicial activism in favor of progressive causes, so judicial activism in favor of abortion and other things, these things can be rolled back if there's a perception that due process wasn't followed. Um, also an argument that certain interventions are excessive and violate the other right, the rights of another group disproportionately. So the application of the Me Too strategy to any possible uh, situation of inappropriate sexual behavior, which can range from rape and assault, in which case, it might be easier to prove proportionality, but also things that are technically consensual, but seen as just like less equitable, um, but don't really meet a legal bar of sexual assault. So these, these, these situations are not morally equivalent, but if the strategy of blunt instrument that involves public outing, public shaming, potentially endangering someone's life and their, and their family relationships, um, you could argue that in some of these situations, the strategy also violates the rights of other people to due process. Um, if something is an extreme policy that you have to defend, like chemical castration for pedophiles or uh, military intervention in another country, I think it's quite important to demonstrate that we that you have that. I mean, the actor involved in the motion has tried most alternatives already and are left with this specific solution. And it's important to still demonstrate the proportionality of the solution or to demonstrate the huge social value 
that will be generated through this, uh, through this solution. So let's do some sample exercises here. Let's talk through uh, two emotions and see what framing choices uh, both sides are confronted with for the motions. So the first motion I want to talk through is um, taking obese children into state care. So a lot of time, you need to devote a lot of thought into understanding or painting a picture of the context in which the intervention will happen and what assumptions you are making about the parents and the state for prop side, right? So in proposition side, so some framing uh, decisions include being able to point out that this policy will only kick in when parents have already been engaged, a warning period has lapsed, so you want to characterize the parents here as completely uncooperative un with the state, in fact, quite negligent to the point of endangering their children, um, where you have doctors who have certified that the children face serious health risks, that this is not really altogether new because it is similar to taking children away when they are malnourished, and that these parents are not fit to be parents, right? They're actively harming their child. Um, it's important to be able to demonstrate that a solution can no longer be found in the context of allowing kids to stay with their parents. So painting a picture of how diet is, cannot be an individual or compartmentalized thing, like the family's diet will be the kid's diet. If parents don't take the advice of healthcare professionals seriously, then there's no reason for the child to be able to do it as well. Now, on opposition side, you need to be able to defend something. You can't just talk about how this policy is bad. Like, I think it's important to characterize these parents as uh, struggling with raising their kids, probably because of a lot of other work demands and other, like, factors, like possibly poverty. Um, and that how it's important to continue to engage with the parents and provide the child with counseling. Um, and that the state should intervene where it can. And, and there is no shortage of avenues where the state can intervene anyway without necessarily extracting the child from their family. So healthier school lunches, positive incentives towards the child having healthy behavior and weight loss. Um, but taking the child away will be far more harmful and excessive, right? So frame it as a very cruel policy, as dramatic. Um, it's a form of psychological torture. Um, and we need to do it only in instances where we've determined that there's a real threat to the direct threat to the child's life and where the parents have demonstrated an intention to harm them, which isn't the case now. Um, and then say that this policy is an unfair exteriorization of the blame just to parents, when a lot of this is also a result of state failure. Healthy food is expensive. Uh, there's like wanton advertising that tempts children into unhealthy lifestyle. So we can't single out parents for this problem and our interventions need to be a lot more society-based. And then talk about the kids and how if our intention was to help them, that's not going to work because they'll be resentful. They're likely to be depressed or to suffer under state care. And, un and this is unlikely to succeed. Or even if you succeed in solving the weight problem, you create this you create bigger problems to replace this problem so the second uh motion that we can walk through is uh this house would torture suspected terrorists so extract information um some of the things you think about in prep that have to do with framing is how you would like to characterize terrorists and the information they have and how to characterize the police force and what they will do with the information so the procedure um before torture happens and what happens with the information and also um, what this information looks like. So overall, you might want to distinguish terrorism from other crimes. Talk about why it's so bad, right? The effects on people happen on a mass scale and it's designated um, not just to cause physical harm, but also to rob people of their sense of security and safety, which undermines the foundation of society. Talk about terror cells and how they function. So they're very secretive. It's hard to extract information. Um, once you have access to one source, you want to take advantage of that. But at the same time, torture is but one of the ways we seek information. So we're not going to completely rely on torture. It's just a valuable tool in some cases, especially to prevent attacks that we know are being planned in the near future. So maybe we 
uh, acquire that information through other sources or to capture high level targets or to triangulate information we already have. Um, and we need to do this because terrorists are mentally tough. And while we are going to go through standard interrogation, non-coercive interrogation techniques with them, when these techniques don't work, when these regular procedures don't work, we need to resort to more extreme measures. We will have medical professionals present. We may require warrants from judges before we do this is probably how you frame it on prop. On op, you say, in terms of characterizing the information you get, that it's unlikely to be valuable. So either terrorists are trained to withstand torture and they are going to lie or mislead you, or this person that you are torturing might actually never have had access to the information you're looking for. Because just as Prop said, terror cells operate in very insular ways and they don't share information with each other precisely to avoid situations like this. And then you talk about the police force and say, look, asking justice judges to issue warrants isn't really a check and balance mechanism here because um, judges issue warrants based on information they get from the police in the first place, right? And if you allow the police to torture, even if your intention is for this to be a last resort or to be just one piece of the whole picture, it is likely to be their first weapon of choice. It encourages lazy policing and it leads to a lot of people being needlessly tortured um, even if there's no point because they can't provide the information just for retributive purposes or to shake them up and things like that. Um, this policy is very prone to abuse um, and this will just lead to further radicalization and increased terrorist recruitment. And you might want to step back and go, how different now is the state from the criminals that wants to punish if we use the same tools that they do? And whereas in prop you go, that's exactly why we're restricted in this war, because they're willing to do things we are not willing to do. But some sometimes like peace has a price and you need some violence in order to achieve peace. And then that's a back and forth between the two themes. But just to be conscious that your rhetorical strategies, right, the way you choose to paint a picture of the actors involved and the process involved, which really is largely framing, becomes very become very, very important in debates like this. So anyway, I hope that was helpful and I hope you enjoy the rest of the module.